I was born in Oklahoma, and we were doing quite well. We had our own house. My dad was working. Well, one evening he was on top of his car watching a baseball game, he and his friend. And a white fella approached my dad and said, could I sit on top of the car with you and watch the game? Well, back then, 29 had soft roof. And my dad was afraid the roof might cave in if three of them were on there. So he just said no. Well, I was raised in the South where it was segregated, uh, blacks and whites. And I was raised on a sharecropper's plantation in Mississippi. So this white man went off and got a brick and knocked my father off the top of that car with that brick. Now, I don't know how many people would calmly take that. Well, my dad didn't calmly take it. And when he came home, he was bloody. He fought back. In a few days, we were in a truck headed for Chicago, and we had a horrible ex experience on the way from Oklahoma to Chicago. But we evidently didn't have any choice. Well, you know, the disconnect between blacks and whites have been there since the founding of this country. Even when Columbus came to discover America, he came with the intent, one, to conquer. Uh, he said he was looking for a place to get to the east to, to, to better trade. But he also came with the blessing of the Pope that says, go out, conquer as you go. If you can convert people to the gospel, do that. If you can't uh, enslave them, if they won't be enslaved, then go ahead and kill them. He got that from the Pope. And we were uh, uh, taught uh, by the communities that blacks and whites had no dealings with each other, live in the same community, and so forth. From the very beginning, Europeans who came to America came with a preconceived idea that we are better than anybody else, and God has called us to conquer the world. And uh, I came north, and while it was not segregated, the neighborhoods still were pretty much uh, blacks and whites lived in separate uh, neighborhoods. We were all crowded up in one area, but, we, but it was our own area. We had our own barber shops, tailor shop, grocery store. We had in and out of income in our community. Whereas after civil rights, those little stores couldn't compete. And so we lost all the advantages of ownership of business and land. Having been raised in a white community where I was the only black child and I'm not that black. We didn't have separate drinking fountains and separate toilets in Sturgis. The few African American, as we were then colored, folks in town knew where to go and where not to go. When Jesus was in, in the upper room and about to go to the cross, he said to his disciples, this is how people will know that you're mine. It's not because you've got such sharp doctrine. It's not because uh, you're able to get real crowds. The way people are going to know that you're my followers, the way you love one another. I remember when I uh, was drafted into the service and went to Korea. In Korea, the Americans, uh, black and white, were in the same army. And I believe that the decline in interest in the church and the, and the reputation that the church as a whole is having in North America is because the church in North America has never come to grips with that principle that God expects and intends people to love one another. 
and the boys used to get together and uh, drink beer uh, in the motor pool and Saturday night and clown and just have a good time. Uh, I didn't drink and I was in my bunk sleeping and pretending I was sleeping, but they were up drinking beer and singing and having a party. And uh, one of the men named Smitty uh, said to the other guys in the barracks, hey boys, let's get uh, this nigger and uh, chase him across the creek and throw rocks at him. And they says, hey Smitty, hey Smitty, be quiet, you're going to get us into trouble. Be quiet. And he said it again. I said, let's uh, chase this nigga across the creek and throw rocks at him. And they quieted him down, And uh, but he said it twice. And the next day, uh, Smitty and I were going to ordnance school together. And when I got to ordnance school, I asked him, Smitty, uh, what was that you said last night? Uh, he says, I don't know. We were drinking beer, and I, I, I said a lot of things. I said, let me tell you what you said. You said, let's chase this nigger across the creek and throw rocks at him. He said, did I say that? He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I was drinking and not, not uh, at mm. myself. And I said, yes, that alcohol just uh, dumbed your uh, uh, subconscious and you said what was in your heart. And I said, let me ask you another question. We're in a war together. I'm not the enemy. The enemy is out there, the North Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, what if you get killed in this war? Uh, do you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell? Uh, he says, I want to go to heaven. I says, do you know how to get there? He <laughs> said, no. And so I was a new Christian and we would, um, uh, with the chaplain, uh, tell guys how they could be saved. And uh, so I told him John 3.16 and told him how he needed to be uh, have a savior and that Jesus was the one who came and died for our sins and uh, that uh, that's how you could get to heaven if something should happen instead of going to hell. And uh, he thanked me and we became good friends. If the church had been in love with one another, we've never had this cleavage between blacks and whites as we've had it. We would not have uh, one percent of the people at the top having all of the wealth and the people, the 90 percent at the bottom, whatever that percentage is, not having it. The failure of the people in the church to come together and to commit themselves to loving one another is at the root of all the problems that we see in, the, in, in, in this country and, and certainly even all over the world.